Okay, I think we'll make a start. It's almost five past six. So welcome everyone. It's lovely to see you here this evening. Um, welcome to the latest um, Cafe Med, um, which is focusing on improving outcomes in pelvic cancers. Um, I'm joined today by Professor Anne Kilty and Mr. George Ramsey, um, who are gonna give you an overview of research um, into this area. Um, we should be finished tonight about half past seven. There is no fire alarms planned, so if the fire alarm does go off, you're just straight out of the doors there, and toilets are up to the back and to the right. My name is Rachel Elliott. I'm part of the public engagement with research unit at the University of Aberdeen. So this cafe series is one of four cafes that we hold on a monthly basis. Um, it would be great to have you at our other cafes, and we have leaflets on the table. I'll talk a bit more about that at the end, though. Um, the format for tonight is our speakers will do some opening remarks, then we'll break for 15 minutes so you can refresh your coffee or have a fancy piece. Then we'll open the floor for questions and my colleague Monica will have a roving mic so you can be heard nice and clear. So I'm now going to hand you over um, to George who's going to um, open in. I'm not very good with a microphone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, so thanks very much for coming. The turnout is incredible. Um, my, my name is George Ramsey. I'm one of the um, colorectal surgeons in Aberdeen, and I'm also one of the senior lecturers over in the university. And together with Anne, we're interested in pelvic cancer, and that encompasses um, cancers of the rectum, which I've got a specific interest in, the gynaecology organs um, in, in, in female patients, bladder, and in male patients' prostate. And collectively, they probably make up about one in four of the overall cancer burden, when you look at it r roughly, but there or thereabouts. So it's a substantial proportion of the number of cancers that we see over in the hospital. And they're treated in different ways. They are different cancers, so obviously they will have different treatments. And I'll concentrate on the rectal cancer and then explain why um, it's relevant to the others just in a minute or two. In, in the rectum, which is basically the bit of the large bowel that goes into the pelvis itself, um, it doesn't really have anywhere to go. It can't get any bigger. It can only grow into other organs if it was to get bigger, unfortunately. So if it's an early enough growth that's there once it's detected, and we do MRI scans to check this, we take it out and we'll do an operation straight away. But the challenge is and the worry is that we might leave some inside if we were to do that in certain circumstances. So if it's bigger than that and it's potentially moving into other organs and, and, and becoming locally advanced, we'll give the patient radiotherapy and chemotherapy potentially and then go for an operation at that stage. Um, and what's quite interesting about this is that in <laughs> reasons that we can't quite work out yet, about 20% of these patients will not get any response whatsoever to the neoadjuvant, the preoperative chemoradiotherapy. The tumour stays about the same size over the course of the treatment, and then we have to embark on quite a sizable operation to do that. In about 60% of times, the tumour will get small enough so that we can safely do an operation and, and be fairly confident that we can remove the entirety of it. But in about 20% of these cases, and remember, these are the larger tumours that are there, one in five of them will shrivel away to nothing, and we will get a complete response. And to date, we don't know which ones are likely to have a complete response versus which ones that are not, uh, don't have any response whatsoever. And clinically, that's quite, it's obviously a very important um, question for patients in particular, but clinically, if we could predict those individuals that were going to get a complete response, we'd be able to treat them differently to those that were likely to be heading towards an operation. And one of the areas that I think is important from, from a surgical side is if we can predict those individuals who are going to have a minimal response to therapy beforehand, we shouldn't give it. And we should go straight for a much bigger operation and try and remove as much as possible because we're wasting time, if you, if you like, in that context. So the real holy grail of colorectal or rectal surgery at the moment is can we predict for response before we even embark on any therapy whatsoever? And in conventional therapy at the moment, we've got biopsies and we have MRI scans, but none of them are able to determine what um, or, or predict for outcome in this context. And there's a lot of other units, obviously, looking at this. 
in particular looking at genetics of the person or genetics of the tumour that's there. But there's been little that has been revolutionary in that context in terms of you know, predictions associated with that. Not all rectal cancers are the same and not all of the biology within each rectal cancer is the same as well. So you might biopsy a bit on the outside that's not representative to the bit on the inside. So it's really difficult to determine. There is some work that says that you can do it in the resection sample, so post-operatively. But by that point, the patient's already had their operation, so it's not particularly helpful going forward. Um, and there are, you know, I, do, I don't do bladder or prostate or, or, or gynecology, but the similar set of variability and response is present in those settings as well. So at the moment, we've got a group of individuals that we know have cancer. We know that some of them might respond very well. We know that some of them won't respond very well. And then we've got a group in the middle that will have some element of response. And what we'd like to look to see is whether we can finesse that a little bit more and, and, and ask whether we can predict for neoadjuvant response beforehand. And instead of looking at the genetics and the biomarkers, we're interested in the microbiota and the fecal matter in particular. From my side, the rectum is where the feces goes past. And so logically, there's as much um, potential that the bacteria within that could have influences on that specific tumor as the normal cells on the outside, on, um, you know, from the human as well. And, you know, there's a lot on the microbiota at the moment, and we know it's different in patients that are likely to have cardiovascular disease. We know it's different in patients that have autism as well. So it stands to reason it might have influences on an organ slightly closer to home, if you like, like the rectum. And so the key question is, can we determine from the bacterial composition of the feces as to whether the patient's going to have a really good or a really poor response to therapy? And we think that Aberdeen's ideally suited for this. Certainly, that's how we sell it to funders. But we've got the Rowett Influence, we've got the Rowett Institute just next door. And one of the advantages that Aberdeen has is that all the therapies are all on one site. We've got radiotherapy here, we have chemotherapy here, and we've got most of the surgical specialties here. The only bit of um, surgery that we don't have here is transplant, but that's not, in, that's not particularly relevant in this context. So because everything's on site and because we're a moderate sized unit, we're able to speak to each other. We're not too big to be able to do that, but we're not too small so we've got adequate numbers of patients coming through to be able to try and address this as time goes on. So Anne has, and I have set up a, a study looking at whether the microbiota can influence the response and, and we've, we've got about 450 patients that we're going to um, recruit for this specific question. And the nitty gritty is beyond me, so I'll hand over to Anne. So, so thanks very much, George. So I'm Anne Kilty. I'm the Friends of Anchor Clinical Chair of Oncology here at the University of Aberdeen. And I only came in June 2021. Um, and George had already started working on the microbiota, the gut um, bacteria, with Karen Scott and other people in the Rowett Institute before I came. So there was a great setup here already. Um, so my interest is not only the composition of the microbiota, because there's quite a lot of evidence in cancer studies, particularly in a thing called immunotherapy, which is the new kind of trendy way of treating cancer, um, that the composition of the patient's feces, the microbiota in the feces um, at the start of treatment is actually predictive of whether they'll respond or not respond to the immunotherapy. So the logic behind that is, well, if that's the case in immunotherapy, why isn't it the case for radiotherapy, which is what I treat people with, or other chemotherapies, and indeed possibly even surgery and other treatments. So um, what we want to do here in Aberdeen, uh, we've already done some pilot studies. So we got the biorepository, which um, is NHS Grampian biorepository, is able to take um, largely tumours and other samples from patients, but we actually got their ethics modified so that we could take poo samples from patients with that. And their biorepository research nurse, uh, Rachel Moore, did a phenomenal job of collecting um, patients for us. So it was about 75 patients in six months. And then it was another 80 patients that we added on. Uh, and I think we underestimated just how much work she, she did, actually. <laughs> um, so, so the thing about the biorepository is you don't get very much clinical data because we want to really see 
is the microbiota associated with how people respond to the various treatments. And with the, micro, with the biorepository data, you're not allowed to access that data. Um, you can potentially access it a different way, but essentially you don't. So we got some very useful data from um, patients. We managed to send, um, the, in fact, Susan, who's one of my technicians, she um, was heavily involved in this, Susan Hay. Um, we took the feces samples from patients and took them to the lab, extracted what's called the DNA, so some, one of the core elements, and sent it off for sequencing called 16S our RNA sequencing. Um, and um, I can pass this around, but this is the sort of plots that you get. What it's telling you is the relative um, proportions of different bacteria that you get in the, um, in the feces in different samples. These are ones from mice, actually. But I'll, you can hand, you feel free to hand this, hand this round. Uh, but it just shows you different bacteria, different amounts. And the idea is that it might be that we can look at patterns in the, the proportions of the, the bacteria and correlate that with how well patients do after their cancer, treatment, cancer treatments. Um, but before we get the feces to that point, um, we learnt a lot from our pilot experiments. So in the Rowett, there are often a lot of volunteer studies where people, not, not patients, so um, people in the community volunteer to, ha to, to give fecal samples and other samples for the different dietary and um, metabolic studies at the Rowett. And what they do is, for the fecal studies, they poo into this rather disgusting looking plastic uh, blue pot, which is about this size, and sort of loops over the toilet. They poo into that in a plastic bag in there, and then they bring it up to the Rowett. So we started with that in the hospital, and Rachel, after about two patients, decided this was not going to happen, because um, the lids don't screw on very well, and so she was stuck in a in a lift with various other patients with this smelly pot and her just mortified thinking somebody think will think my colostomy bags exploded or something. So, so we then moved on. So this was the whole point of the pilot studies was to really road test things. So what we've got instead now is that we ask patients to fill up one of these little blue pots. So it's really like a urine test container. So all, you know, virtually every patient's given a urine test, so people are happy with that. Uh, and it's a little pooper scooper in it. And then it all seals up really nicely. And then it means if somebody's coming on public transport or whatever, that's in their handbag, it's not a big deal. Um, and then um, I say, we also discovered this amazing thing from Holland. Uh, um, I think Susan may have found this, I don't know. Uh, but this is called fecal. So fecal, fecal. Um, and this, personally, my mission is to get this, um, we'll hand this around as well. My mission is to get this um, introduced as part of the national screening program. I'm certainly of an age that I've done the screening uh, at least twice. <laughs> and um, the whole idea is they send you this revolting set of instructions saying, oh, poo into some toilet paper or poo into a... Tupperware container. I mean, this is just disgusting, really. So what, what this is, and this costs fractions of pennies, is uh, the fecal paper. So what you do is really cool. You basically put this over the toilet seat, um, and it sort of it sinks down slightly into the toilet. And then you basically poo into that, and then use your little pooper scooper. And then all you do at the end is that you tear the paper in two strips. It drops into the toilet bowl, you leave it there for a minute, and then you just flush it away. So I'm a great fan of this. So I'll give you <laughs> this turn around as well. Um, but it, I think it would be amazing if, um, if we could actually get that introduced in the national screening program, because it would be a lot more pleasant for people. You probably have a higher uptake of people actually taking their fecal samples. So, so we learned a lot from our pilot studies um, because we wanted to um, collect the outcome data from patients and we also wanted to explore the relationship of their diet with their feces because on the basis of rubbish in, rubbish out, you would assume that if you're eating good things, your bacteria would be getting feeding off the good things, the good fibre in your, in your diet and therefore uh, enhancing the good bacteria in your feces, well, in your colon, essentially, uh, to be absorbed, these good nutrients to be absorbed by the body, which could be fighting the cancer. Because George has mentioned colorectal cancer, which obviously geographically is very close to the feces, etc. But what's fascinating is that there's now evidence that um, altering the microbiota or altering your diet can actually influence the tumour growth of tumours outside the, the, the colon, so for example, bladder cancer um, and other tumours that are 
by definition not in the gastrointestinal tract. And there's various mouse studies, and we've actually done some ourselves and, and demonstrated that. So that's what's really exciting, is that there must be something happening that you're eating the fibre, it's being modified by the bacteria, that's releasing certain chemicals that somehow are getting absorbed into the, the bloodstream or the lymph, we're not entirely sure, or the immune system's having a reaction to it, and that's actually acting outside the bowel. So that's a kind of really exciting uh, new, new, new finding, uh, which ties up a bit with the uh, immunotherapy studies as well. Um, so, so the idea is that we're going to try and look at 450 patients in the next year or so, um, and we've started this study. And so it's NFD with um, a pelvic cancer that's going to come and have radiotherapy or surgery. We are approaching them from the clinic, so our clinician uh, colleagues are being very helpful handing out the patient information sheets and mentioning the patient study to them. And then we follow that up with a little phone call or a near me um, to, to explain the study further. So here we're not just asking for a poo specimen, but we're actually asking patients to fill in diet diaries and diet um, food frequency questionnaires, they're called. So it's a bit more intensive as a study, uh, but we had to get this through ethics. So George did an absolutely sterling job <laughs> of getting it through IRAS, it's called, which is the, uh, the system for getting proper clinical trials um, through ethics. And it's a fairly, well, it's a very painful experience. <laughs> <laughs> very, yeah, it was very painful. Anyway, so we got, we got there, and we started recruiting patients, and we've already got the first four samples through in the last two, two or three weeks, so that's great. Um, so we're building up the patient numbers on that um, by, by phoning them up and, and chatting to them after they've been approached for the study. So, so that's kind of monitoring, really looking at baseline data relative to outcomes, uh, so for radiotherapy outcomes, surgical outcomes, and I think you know, that's going to be a terrific study, um, a single centre study. The idea is then how can we move that forward to maybe being incorporated into actual randomised controlled clinical trials um, nationally, so a lot of our uh, colleagues are very interested in this, and um, you know, we've got the paper on the mouse data and some clinical data from the pilot studies has, has been submitted for publication, and I think once that's published, that'll really... Uh, kickstart um, more interest in this. But what I'm also really interested in is uh, in intervention. So this is, that's just kind of saying, oh, this is a patient, they turn up, that's what's in their poo, this is their chances of doing well or badly with a particular cancer treatment. So that's great. But what really we're thinking of is what we call intervention studies. So can we do anything to modify the microbiota? For example, changing the diet or adding a supplement to the diet that would allow um, the microbiota to be changed to enhance the beneficial chemicals to make the tumours respond better. So um, very early days on that at the moment, but um, we're taking the approach of dietary fibre is the thing that really feeds the gut microbiota. And there's various fibres, either soluble fibres or insoluble fibres. So you can think of insoluble things like fiber gel that people take for their, their um, constipation. But there are other soluble fibers. So there's inulin, there's pectin, there's beta-glucans, there's all sorts of fibers. So we can kind of keep going on this for many years, is the hope, <laughs> as we work our way through all these fibers. Um, and one of them we're particularly interested in is inulin, uh, which is a soluble fiber that we know in mice uh, delays the, the rate of the growth of tumors um, outside the gut in mice. So... Um, we're hoping, friends of Anchor have essentially agreed for a, a medical student who's been in my lab before to come for a year to start the, the preparatory groundwork for doing a clinical study, an intervention study. And things like surgery and radiotherapy is all quite complicated. So one of the kind of um, groups of patients that we think um, would be the first one to approach is, is men that have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, but it's at an early stage and it's a low grade under the microscope. It's called um, Gleason 6 disease or, or grade group 2 disease. And the idea is that many of them are often told, at the moment you don't need any active treatment, but we're just going to sit and watch you with regular um, MRI scans or, and, and um, biopsies of the prostate. Uh, and it may be that you never need any further treatment, or you may at some point need to go ahead and have your, your prostate out or prostate radiotherapy. And that, that group of men are very much kind of sitting there in limbo going, oh gosh, what can I do to make things better for me? So are a kind of captive audience when it comes to saying, oh, how, how about you would like to maybe think about being involved in a study of, of this dietary supplement. So um, 
We're hoping that, that Daniel, the medical student, is going to be able to start some preparatory work, um, particularly auditing the last 10 years of the men on active surveillance, because a lot of people go for years and years and years with no trouble at all, and they're the people we don't really want in our study. Actually, Daniel is there. Hello. <laughs> Daniel is, is, is at the back here. Um, so they're the patients that we don't really want in the study because you need events. In clinical trials, you need events. You need something to happen. So you want... Um, people where, who, who are more likely to, to need some future treatment to be in the study. So Daniel's going to look at, I think it's going to be 500 sets of notes <laughs> to, to see what proportion would be the most uh, likely to need, you know, to be the best ones to put into our study. And he's also going to do some exciting, what's called qualitative research. So a lot of research is what we call quantitative when you're looking at numbers and proportions and percentages. Qualitative research is much more about getting in with the patients and discussing things with them. So, you know, important aspects of a future study for the patients. So that's um, a major element, which is going to be with Sarah McClellan, who's a, an expert a qualitative researcher here. So that's going to be a really exciting aspect. And then we would hope to be able to st start a study here in these men with, with um, uh, the early stage prostate cancer. And then if that's going swimmingly, we would then hope to progress to, to um, projects on people having radiotherapy and surgery. And I've already got interest from one of my ex-colleagues who's now in Manchester at the Christie about doing one with prostate radiotherapy. So there's lots and lots of exciting opportunities for us to work locally here, whereas George says we've got critical mass to be able to do a lot of the early work and then expand it to our colleagues nationally and, and even internationally. So, um, so yeah, so it's kind of the baseline microbiota, but it's also interventions. Um, and the, the other way you can intervene is by um, actually potentially doing, um, looking at the, the bacteria themselves and modifying the bacteria with um, probiotic drinks, so with actually supplementing the bacteria, that's another uh, element. The reason why I think the, the fiber is exciting is that it's, it's kind of easy to kind of sell to people as a concept. So there, is, there was a study in radiotherapy where they were only really looking at side effects, but they tried to increase the amount of fiber that people had in their diet in a randomized trial. And these were people in their kind of 60s, 70s having radiotherapy. And in reality, uh, they tried to get people on a high-fiber diet, and they didn't manage it. But also, more importantly, they didn't actually get that many people in their study in the first place because people were, well, I'm about to have radiotherapy. I'm not about to start and change my diet. Whereas the argument of supplementing, so giving dietary supplements like a powder sachet that you can put in water and drink or put on yogurt and things, is it's much more like a medicine. And most people by that sort of stage in their life are on medicines already. So it's not such a, a big sort of culture change having to take something extra before radiotherapy. So we're very aware that any of these intervention studies are during a difficult, stressful period of people's lives. So you don't want to be making it really complicated for people. But one of the rationales for giving the fiber supplements is that... <coughs> People, for a lot of these pelvic cancers, uh, the state-of-the-art treatment is chemotherapy combined with the radiation. And that's really quite toxic. And to be honest, once you get over the age, much beyond 80 years of age, you're not going to tolerate that treatment. So you would just be given probably radiotherapy alone, which is not the state-of-the-art treatment. So we're trying to say, well, if we could give the dietary fiber supplements that were working as well as adding the chemo, that would be a new state-of-the-art treatment and could be applicable to, to older people as well. Because um, cancer is very much a, a disease of the ageing population and the people are getting older and older um, that have cancer. I mean, I treat people in their 90s with radiotherapy for cure for bladder cancer, um, which some people think is weird. But to be honest, if, if you treat somebody aged 93 for their bladder cancer and they die in their sleep of heart failure aged 96, as far as I'm concerned, that's... A success um, because they haven't died of horrible symptoms from a, an uncontrolled bladder tumor in their in their pelvis. So, um, but yeah, there is very much an aging population. I mean, when I, when I trained at the Christie Hospital, if you were over seventy with breast cancer, you didn't get radiotherapy in in the in the 19, early nineteen nineties. So things have changed massively since since then. Um, but it's finding appropriate treatments for for the older people in the population that they're going to tolerate. Um, 
So I don't know if, if there's anything else I should be saying. I don't know. I think, so. don't think, I think that's probably Great. about it. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. It's now just half past um, six, so we'll break for 15 minutes. The cafe's open, so feel free to um, grab another cup of coffee. And we'll start again at quarter to seven. Thank you.